welcome to episode number 611 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. Do you remember the days before anomaly detection? So, why did it stop working? I don't know, it just started to smell funny and then started smoking, so we turned it off. (laughs) Thank goodness our measure of whether machinery has broken down isn't smelling bad or shutting down entirely anymore. (laughs) My guest this week is Rachel Johnson from MathWorks, and we're talking all about anomaly detection and AI. We explore how AI can work in tandem with engineers to reduce the incidence of defects and optimize maintenance schedules, and the steps involved in designing and deploying an AI-based anomaly detection system, from concept to data gathering to deployment and integration. So without further ado, please welcome Rachel to Fish Fry. Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, it's great to be with you today. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about AI and anomaly detection today. But first, Rachel, why will AI play an important role in creating smart factories and specifically automating anomaly detection? Maybe I'll start by saying that in my role at MathWorks, I work with customers across all kinds of industries, right? Manufacturing, right? That's what we're mostly talking about today, but also, you know, aerospace, automotive, other industries. And really, I think everyone is looking to make use of all of this data, right? More effectively, so they can be more competitive out there. So when we talk about smart factories using AI, right, to become smarter, it's really this spectrum. I I don't know that we can always say a factory is smart or not. It's this journey that everybody's on towards becoming smarter. So we're living in this era of data. It's getting bigger every day. And it's really impossible for engineers to monitor everything now. We see the complexity of software growing. These traditional methods of analyzing data and software really aren't going to cut it anymore. So these smart factories, right, we're looking to make use of that data, use AI to scale and just become more competitive, right, and uncover these insights that they may not have known existed before. And that's where we get to talking about anomaly detection. That makes sense. Now, how can AI work in tandem with engineers to reduce the incidence of defects and optimize maintenance schedules? I think it's an important point about working in tandem. You said in tandem. This is really key. AI is about really enabling engineers to scale their expertise. It's, it's not a replacement for their domain knowledge. And I think this is really important to emphasize here. I think it's a common misconception that AI is somehow going to replace the knowledge of engineers. That has not been you know, what we've seen working with engineering companies at MathWorks. It's really becoming this way for them to scale and better apply their expertise. And part of the reason for that is engineers can't do everything manually. So Let me maybe talk about an example about a company that I was working with, IM Corp. So this company was focusing on detecting anomalies in underground power cables. So it's very data-rich environment, very complex signals. And they had these trained analysts with years of experience who really could look at these signals and figure out what was going on, right? Is there an anomaly in the signal? They would sometimes reach different conclusions about the same signal, even though they were highly trained, right? They really understood their domain. So what this company did, IM Corp, they trained an AI algorithm to analyze these signals, go in and make predictions about what anomalies are occurring in the signals. So now these analysts have to spend less time on monotonously staring at signals all day, and they can can focus on the, the more important tasks, like the real engineering work that they want to do. This is, I think, a great example of how AI combined with engineering expertise can really help improve operations. And anomaly detection is one of the most common of these AI applications that we see, because really it's just asking when we say anomaly, right? Does something look different, right? This could be a sensor or component process, just is something going on that's different? And then the engineers can go in and investigate that 
and more quickly take the right action. You know, we're seeing this being used to improve maintenance schedules, uh, right, increase efficiency, and really just help engineers do better work. That makes sense. So, Rachel, what are the steps involved in designing and deploying an AI-based anomaly detection system from the concept to the data gathering to deployment and eventually integration? Right. Yeah, there's a lot to it. I like to think about it in four major steps. So maybe let's walk through each one of them. Really, when we talk about AI, it's always starting with data and what data you have. But you also have to define the problem you want to solve with that data and whether those go together. So step one is really about problem scoping and definition and based on the data that you've gathered. So what problem are you trying to solve? What data do you have to support that problem? Right? You need good data. You need a problem. So most engineers, I think, already understand how their systems work. What does an anomaly mean in their system? And you know, using their expertise is really important in this scoping step. Right? So that's step one. Step two, once we've decided, okay, I've gathered some data, I know the type of problem I'm trying to solve, now we get into data exploration and processing. So this typically means things like organizing, labeling, pre-processing data, really getting it into a nice clean state so you can go train an AI model next. We're usually talking about time series data. So, you know, signals coming from machine sensors. That's typically the type of data that we're our engineers are collecting a lot of, right? They want to analyze it with AI. So looking at all this data, do I know when anomalies have happened? You know, can I label those anomalies? If I can't, that's important to know. And often this is also going to involve a step called feature engineering, which really means we're pulling out relevant quantities from the data so that we can differentiate between normal and anomalous information. Like a very simple example might be okay, just the mean of the signal has shifted and this might indicate that there's some anomaly, right? Very simple feature. So this is all the step two data exploration, processing, right? Feature extraction. All of this has to happen before we can then go into step three, which is actually training an AI model, right? So this is the part we want to get to. And it's iterative. We, you know, need to look at a variety of different types of models. And then of course, once you've trained it, you need to validate it on data it hasn't seen before. Okay, so now you have a trained and validated model. That's step three, but you're really not done until you take that and put it into operation, right? So you need to take that algorithm and actually put it out into your smart factory or wherever it is that you're deploying it. You might be deploying it directly onto an embedded device, or you might be putting it in a cloud environment for operating on you know, data that's streaming to the cloud. So this is all step four, right? Deployment and integration. This is where we really get the value of AI in general, right? So we're not just training it for the sake of training it. We need to put it out there so it's we're getting use out of it. We've seen our customers deploying algorithms, you know, for many years. And deploying AI is, you know, something that folks are are looking to do now, right? They're they're training on all this data. You need to get it out there. So that's the process. I think about it as four steps, right? Data scoping and problem definition, data exploration and processing, model training and validation, and then deployment integration. So I guess I would say that the vast majority of that effort is in steps one and two. So it's really important to make sure you take time to scope the problem. That makes sense. Now, how can engineers select the appropriate AI learning technique based on the type of data collected? Yeah, it's... Important to think about the type of data you have so that you can apply the right AI technique. Typically, I like to break this into two categories. If the data we've collected is unlabeled, meaning I don't know where the anomalies are or it's entirely just normal operation, right? This is actually pretty common because a lot of folks go out and do regular maintenance, right? We don't want our systems to break. We don't want things to go wrong. So oftentimes, anomalies are pretty infrequent. So you might have the vast majority of normal data. This is where you can use what are called unsupervised approaches for AI. Now, if you have a bunch of labeled data, right, you have examples of anomalies that have happened, then you can use supervised AI approaches. And there's different algorithms in both of these categories. Either way, you really need to train several possible models, right? So exploring different techniques, 
And if the accuracy is not high enough, you need to go back and ask, well, do I need to collect more data? Are there maybe different features, different pre-processing steps that I needed to do? So it is an iterative process. And in MATLAB, we actually have tools to help iterate on this. I'll talk about one of them briefly. So we have a tool called Predictive Maintenance Toolbox, and there's an interactive app called the Diagnostic Feature Designer which is meant to help engineers go and explore different features. And this means they can import their data, extract the most useful features, right, to train an AI model, and then go back and iterate and say, okay, let's look at some different features. We can go through this, train a whole bunch of different AI models using what's called our classification learner app and say, which one's going to be the most accurate, right? So there's not always a linear path to getting to the best technique. Okay, so Rachel... What do you think are the best practices for validating and verifying data accuracy? I mentioned the importance earlier of uh, having labeled data, right? So sometimes you may not have labeled anomalies, but it's really important to have examples of what anomalies look like in order to validate the algorithm. Meaning, how do I know if the algorithm is working if I've never even tested it on something that looks like an anomaly? So these can be really hard to come by. And something we've seen a lot of interest in, especially from engineers who have a lot of uh, knowledge of how their systems operate, is if they have simulations of the systems that they're doing anomaly detection on, they can actually generate some synthetic data from simulation to validate their models. So using tools like Simulink and Simscape, you you can create physics-based models of systems. You can actually generate some synthetic data and actually use that to validate the algorithm. Beyond that, I think it's also important, right? Even once an algorithm is in operation, it's working, you know, you're getting value out of it. It's really important to continuously monitor and validate the algorithm over time because things can drift. You know, the environment can change, the operational requirements can change. And there's an example, a a company we worked with called Ertzen Digital Systems, they were creating these AI solutions for wastewater treatment plants. And they created a a scalable AI solution. So they deployed using MATLAB production server. And what they were able to do was not only detect anomalies in machines, so they do real-time anomaly detection, but also detect when the system needed to be retrained using new data. So they're detecting drift in their system. So it's not just about validating it before it's deployed. It's also about continuously keeping an eye on how things are are changing. All right, Rachel. Well, it is time for your off-the-cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? <laughs> it's a good thing I'm really hungry right now. <laughs> I think I would say, this is real specific, okonomiyaki in Hiroshima style. So I this is basically a massive layered Japanese pancake that's like savory with cabbage and meat and egg and smothered in Japanese barbecue sauce. Had this amazing experience in Japan once on this tiny fourth floor restaurant in Hiroshima. It's like a little bar with only eight seats and the chef made it right in front of me. And I think it was like the best meal I've ever had in my life. So I could really go for something like that right now. That sounds amazing. (laughs) Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Rachel. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. If you want even more information about this topic, including a blog written by Rachel called Industrial Machinery Anomaly Detection, I've included a slew of links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If LinkedIn is more your thing, you can follow me or us on LinkedIn. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. 
And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by me, and our brand new animated series called Libby's Lab. And, of course, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of December 13th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.